Hello, good evening, good morning to some of you. I see where it's probably morning where you are. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and get started. Um, welcome everyone to the fifth event in our Merge series. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm Maggie Harrington from Orphan, and I'm really excited to have you all here. We have two fantastic presentations tonight. So I'm just starting a bit early with housekeeping items and intros so we can get right into our program. So about Emerge, the focus of tonight's session is Rotomin Cardiac Surgery. And to those of you who are new to our events, Emerge stands for Education Meetings for Expanding Rotomin Guided Excellence. And the aim of the series is to highlight evidence-based best practices for improving outcomes for critically bleeding patients. The core focus of these sessions is to harness knowledge transfer of Rotom guided patient blood management strategies to enhance patient safety, optimize resources, and reduce costs. So I'm gonna to quickly touch on some housekeeping items before we get going. First, we'll be following up with you with a really short survey um, after the event. So if you could please take a few moments to let us know what you think of tonight's event, um, that will be coming in the next couple of days. Uh, and then just a couple of things to point out about this Zoom session. First, I want to let everyone know that the session is being recorded. And the format for tonight will be two back-to-back 30-minute -back presentations followed by a 30-minute question and answer session where both of our speakers will take questions from the audience. Um, for any of the questions that our speakers can't get to due to running out of time, we'll be sure to publish a list of questions and answers in a follow-up email. Next, a quick note on poll questions. Our speakers have added some poll questions into their presentations. And I wanna let you know that the poll responses are completely anonymous. So please don't be shy in participating and answering. Uh, we'll keep the poll questions on screen for about 30 seconds before displaying the results from the group. And next are introductions. So I'll first quickly introduce our fantastic Warfin team. First from Brisbane, we have Craig O'Sullivan, who's our product manager for acute care diagnostics. And also in Brisbane, we have Natasha Curie. She's a clinical application specialist who covers the Rotom training and education across Queensland. Next from Perth, we have Julia Bonzer, clinical application specialist who looks after the Rotom training and education in Western Australia, the Northern Territory, South Australia, and Tasmania. Joining us from Melbourne, we have Azade Zargari, our system specialist who looks after the Rotom training and education for Victoria. We also have with us tonight from here in Sydney, Kieran Pickles, our national sales manager, and Peta Samaris, our acute care diagnostics product specialist. And once again, I'm Maggie, and I look after the Rotom training and education in New South Wales and the ACT. Finally, I'm excited to introduce our amazing guest speakers. We're honored to have two Rotom experts presenting for us this evening. Our first expert joining us tonight from here in Sydney, New South Wales, is Dr. Catherine Downs. Dr. Downs is a cardiac anesthetist on Randwick campus in Sydney. She co-authored an article in the 2017 Blue Book on implementing Rotem to your campus. Since then, the cardiac algorithm has evolved to include platelet function testing and a pediatric algorithm has been developed for Sydney Children's Hospital. Catherine will explain the Rotem traffic light system used to reduce error, create a management plan based on the Rotem results, and enhance communication with ICU. Tonight, she will discuss the integration of goal-directed transfusion using Rotem and platelet function testing in cardiac surgery. Having Dr. Down speak is such a privilege for us as she has invested years of tireless work along with her team to create the Rotem algorithms and protocols that many of you are using today in your hospitals around New South Wales and beyond. Her guidance has been invaluable to many hospitals as they've started up with Rotem, and she has always been incredibly generous in sharing the work of her team to help other sites avoid the need to have to reinvent the wheel with developing these resources. So many of the resources, including a really fantastic video detailing the Randwick Critical Bleeding Protocol are posted on our Eventbrite page. So please go and check them out if you haven't already. Our second speaker is the one and only Dr. Klaus Gorlinger. Dr. Gorlinger is a leading international expert in the management of coagulopathy and hemostatic resuscitation. He has over 26 years of experience working as an anesthetist, intensivist, and hemostasiologist at the University Hospital Essen in Germany. And his main passion of research is the development and implementation of points of care guided algorithms 
for goal-directed perioperative bleeding management and patient blood management. Tonight, he'll be sharing evidence along with his own expertise on Rotem-guided bleeding management in cardiovascular surgery. We're always so honored to have Dr. Grolinger chair our events as his expertise is second to none. Please be sure to visit our event page to view the full bios for both of our speakers. And without further ado, please welcome them both. And I will hand it over to you, Dr. Downs, to kick us off first. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. And I am trying to share my screen. So can you let me know when you can see that, Maggie? Yep, we can see it. Thank I'm you. never that comfortable being called an expert, certainly an enthusiast. Um, all right, so thank you for that lovely introduction. And um, I'm titling my talk, Evidence-Based Transfusion in Cardiac Surgery. Just hopefully page turns. So as Maggie mentioned, we on Ramwick campus are actually relative newbies to all of this. Unlike many campuses that had Rotom deltas and other viscoelastic assays, Years before us, we bought one of the first Rotom Sigma machines in Australia, maybe the first, back in 2015, and introduced that to a totally Rotom naive campus, which gave us a slightly different angle. Um, it's a big campus. There's four hospitals, Prince of Wales, Royal Women's, Sydney Children's, and also the Prince of Wales private hospitals. So we developed and got approved uh, two adult algorithms um, and one paediatric algorithm, reduced our transfusions in cardiac surgery and published that in the blue book back in 2016. And for those that haven't seen them, these are our algorithms, the pretty ones. This is the cardiac one with its um, cryo dosage schedule and multiplate that's new. This is the obstetric one that we also use in general theatres. We don't do a lot of trauma and it's pretty and pink. And this is the one that we've developed for Sydney Children's Hospital. The main difference being that it then has all of the products in mils per kilo, but they're all very similar apart from that. So what I'd like to do with this talk um, is firstly explain how we integrated Rotem with the existing massive transfusion protocol on our campus. So after that Blue Book article, this was the next job. We had to do a lot of collaboration to create this new thing that we call the critical bleeding protocol. After that, I'm going to talk about how we then moved to cardiac and we were looking at the best practice guidelines and we've looked at preoperatively uh, things that we could improve, how to predict bleeding, not that easy, how to optimise timing of surgery and also looking at always following the algorithm, which is a recommendation of most of the guidelines and developing a sticker to reduce into individual variation in clinical practice and improve communication and documentation. We've also standardized our dosing of tranexamic and protamine. Uh, previously, it was pretty random. And big job working with hematology to include platelet function testing. And for us, that meant dealing with the lab and a turnaround test at the lab, which we're now using preoperatively as well. So these are the next two kind of things. And first, I'm going to talk about how we integrate a rodent with the existing MTP. So I like this saying, design, collaborate, share. It's really what you have to do, and it, it takes time. Firstly, we had to design a, the pre-existing massive transfusion protocol PAC system into a system that supported Rotem. And so to do that, we had to collaborate with a campus-wide transfusion committee. So it is run, obviously, by hematology and blood bank. It then has arms into each of the four hospitals. And as a subcommittee over that, we established the Rotem Working Party. And this was a really important thing. Um, it's chaired by a cardiac anaesthetist. Unfortunately, that's still me, but I will pass that on to someone enthusiastic in future. And it's got members, including anaesthetists from all four of the hospitals, hematologists, nurses, some medical admin people and perfusion also come when it's relevant. So this is how we got all this done with the transfusion committee and the Rotom working party. So the first job was implementing um, the MTP PAC system and we didn't do anything clever. We just had to work with the CNSs and the hematologists to evolve the MTP system to have two arms, a Rotom guided and a non-Rotom guided. So when the consultant activates a clinical a critical bleed, uh, it releases four units of PAC cells and then they inform the blood bank if they're going Rotom guided or non-Rotom guided. And it's not clever. It just looks simple like this. 
the right hand side you all know it pack one pack two they still use that sometimes when they start a critical bleed in the ed if there's no one down there um, from anesthetics or emergency and then the rotom guided arm four units of pack cells are released initially and then further red cells based on blood loss or hemoglobin and then it links into the algorithms so that the yellow products we call it in our video can then be released based on rotum results repeating the rotum 10 minutes after each intervention so uh, the critical bleeding protocol obviously it's a big document from hematology but this is this is the main bit that's on the walls where you activate it you send off these bloods they send you four units of blood and then if you're going rotum guided, you click on one of those links. And this is for the adult. So this brings up the two adult algorithms that I showed you. Or if you wanted to, um, you could start non-rotum and get a pack. This happens mostly in the emergency department or someone's on the wards with a gastro bleed. They might do that first. And then someone from anesthetics or, emer or um, ICU arrives. And then the second round, they go to rotum guided and, and take it from there around and around until the bleeding's finished. Um, importantly, with that, we've designed these stickers. Now, I really, these are available on the Eventbrite page, as is the video. So we've developed an educational video that's given to all the new staff on the orientation day. That's on the Eventbrite page as well. And I could send you the background to that and you could do your own voiceover if you want to um, about how it works. Uh, because other places have PAC systems and MTP systems, so they need to know the language. You have to ask for a critical bleeding protocol. You have to say if it's rotum or non-rotum. And then we have these stickers at all the rotum machines. And I really cannot advise you enough to please use these. I have seen some of the smartest people that I know get this wrong under pressure. So if that can happen to them, it can happen to me, it can happen to anybody here. Um, with these stickers, and I developed these in collaboration with the nursing staff, it's uh, for cardiac and also for general obstetric, you just start and do the pink bits, pink for girls because we have the women's hospital. I did this with the nursing staff, which is why it says below and above, because they didn't want greater than or less than symbols, but I snuck them in when we added the multi-plate. Um, they also didn't want ratios, but I think when I develop these again, rather than having intem and heptem separate for cardiac, I will have intem heptem ratio more than 1.25 red, less than 1.25 green. But apart from that, we're really happy with these stickers. Um, they're stuck on the, in the patient notes on the back of the anesthetic chart. They allow you to then communicate with the next team what you've done and why. Um, and and uh, they really make you follow the algorithm. And if you're not going to follow the algorithm, to reflect on why and write why. Sometimes you don't and you do something different and you just write why, which is, of course, also fine. So recording the results, the nurses or in theatre, usually the anaesthetic registrar fills in the label. So now there's a two person check where we're both looking at it, looking at the numbers, looking at if it's green or red or orange, circling the range that you're in. If it's green or orange, it's no action. I'll show you that on the next slide. You complete a management plan, you stick it in the chart. And we all love good traffic light. The important thing is the orange. Orange means adequate for hemostasis, not normal but adequate for hemostasis. So if you find that your patient's in the orange zone, it should be fine. Uh, watch this space. Obviously, if you keep losing blood, then you might end up needing uh, some products. The situation might change. But uh, you'll notice the nurses then, they fill it in. They'll walk in all nonchalant. It's all green, Kath. Or they'll come tearing in. It's red, it's red. And then it gets actioned quickly. So it engages with the nursing staff. It engages everybody. You're not just on your own in your little bubble working out what you're going to do anymore. You're working with your team. So to say it one last time, we always use a sticker. It reduces individual variation in clinical practice and it improves communication. And I think it's essential for new sites. But I've been doing this for quite a few years now. I think it's essential for all sites and for all people, for documentation, for clarity, uh, for everybody. So that's all I've got to say about integrating Rotom with an MTP, which many people will be interested in how we did that. So now we have departments speaking the same language, as well as the blood bank all speaking the same language, the staff are educated with the video and the documentation is clear. So having done that, we then moved on to improving our practice in cardiac. Next challenge. So this document came out, the European Association Guidelines from Cardiothoracic Anesthesia and Surgery, looking at blood transfusion for adult uh, cardiac patients. And I would ask each of you for, to nominate someone really nerdy in your unit 
like me who wouldn't mind reading this document and having a think about what you could do in your unit as a first task to move towards practice improvement. So we looked through this with the Rotom um, Working Party and we developed, we identified three things that we could do better preoperatively. And that was about predicting bleeding and optimizing timing of surgery. So checking pre-op fibrinogen, predicting bleeding is difficult, but that's one thing. Identifying platelet abnormalities uh, in terms of timing of when to do your operation. We had to work with the surgeons on that and agreeing as a group who needs platelets so we're not wasting them. And then we identified intraoperatively a bunch of things that we could be doing better. The first one, hemodilution. There's not much to say about this. It just takes you to hang a half a litre bag instead of a whole litre bag and keep an eye on it. Um, and the perfusionist will thank you when the patient's not wickedly hemodiluted going on to bypass. Individual heparin protamine titration. I worked on a protocol with that, for that with David De Silva, who's now at Prince Alfred and tranexamic acid, we worked with ICU mostly um, and the literature to find a way that everybody could be giving the same tranexamic acid dose so that we had a starting point for that. Then moving on to the viscoelastic hemostatic, which for us is Rotom, we've managed to work with a hematologist to integrate platelet function testing to our algorithm to guide transfusion of platelets um, and we've created a patient blood management page for all of cardiothoracics, advising users on how and when and what for pre-op, intra-op, post-op. And I'll show you those couple of things shortly. But before I start going through what we've done, we've got two poll questions. So here's the first one, and you can tweak your ears when I say the one that relates to you. Regarding compliance with your Rotom or other viscoelastic algorithm, and documentation which applies to your hospital. A, we have no viscoelastic testing device at our hospital. B, we have a viscoelastic testing device, but we have no real algorithms yet that we're using. C, we have various unapproved algorithms people are using in different departments, but the compliance is pretty optional. D, we've got an approved algorithm, but nobody follows it. E, we've got an approved algorithm on our campus or more than one. Compliance and documentation is a bit up to the individual still. And finally, we have approved algorithm or algorithms, a system for cross-checking it and documenting our decisions and variations. So I'm hoping that Kieran's got to put up a poll page for you if he's awake. And um, if you could click which one that you are, it'll just be interesting to see uh, who is where. I, I guess I'm supposed to answer as well. Like submit. Are you there, Kieran? I am, Kath. We are getting plenty of responses in. I'll give it a few more seconds for you. We had a bit of fun writing all these options earlier today, walking our way through where we've been at, at Randwick campus. <laughs> we've had all of these answers over time at various times. My favourite one being, we have an approved algorithm, but nobody follows it. Anyway, we've moved on from that. We've got about half the group Kath, has responded now, so I'll give it another five seconds and then we'll um, see what the results are for you. Okay, so that's interesting. We've got an approved algorithm on our campus. I'm glad that there's none that nobody follows, um, but compliance is a bit up to the individual. And so that's terrific. And this is the next step that I'm offering you on how to bring it all together. Uh, are you happy if I close that and move on? We've got another poll question. In relation to platelet function testing, do you have a platelet function assessment tool in parallel with the cardiac rotum algorithm? A, we do not have platelet function assessment in use with our algorithm. B, we use multi-plate platelet function testing and we have one at the point of care. C, we use verify now platelet reactivity testing and we have it at point of care. D, we have a multi-plate platelet function testing. We have to send it to the lab. That's where Randwick campus is. E, we use take platelet mapping on our algorithm, ready for your poll, Kieran. 
be up on the we screen. Use we use multiplied in our lab. So this will be interesting to see where people are at. And then I'm going to talk about how we worked in with the hematologists. And it's a big job, but it's not an insurmountable task. You just need an enthusiastic bunch of hematologists who will help you look through all of the literature on this, going through papers in the biochemistry literature and, and some the Marte Petrovic and the Kong papers looking at not just what's normal and abnormal for platelet function, but what does and doesn't predict bleeding and cardiac surgery. So most people are not using platelet function assessment, but it's very useful for cardiac if you can. And we didn't have it either initially. Uh, Multiplate at point of care, I'm jealous, Prince Alfred and other places. Um, and we send ours to the lab. So if you're happy, I'll close that off and I'll continue to tell, the, tell our story, the Roundwick campus story. So cardiac practice improvement. We went through this EACTA guideline. We found three things that I mentioned that we thought we could do better preoperatively, and five things we thought we could do better intraoperatively. So then we had to collaborate again with lots of people, and there were two biggies. So the big biggie first was developing a pre intra post op patient blood management overview guide for all of cardiothoracics. It talks to the JMOs on the ward working out timing. It talks to the anaesthetic and surgical regs, and it also has to then um, be okay for the anaesthetic consultants, surgeons, and ICU. We've done that, and I'll show it to you next slide. The second thing we had to do was working hard with hematology, trying to get access to the platelet function testing, which for us is a lab test getting them to let us use it um, and have it available preoperatively for the uh, JMOs on the ward looking at timing. So they were our two biggies and, uh, you know, it takes time and lots of meetings, but you can do it. Um, so in terms of the pretty page, that's the overview. Pre-op, I don't want you to read this, but it's got pre-op, it's got a section where the platelet stuff's put in with the hematologist. It's got a section on what we do when we're rewarming, early post bypass, protamine, and then post protamine. So we had to design this, we had to collaborate with lots of stakeholders. Then we had to share it. It's up everywhere. Only the yellow bit is on the ward, though, for example. It's paired with the Rotom algorithm I showed you earlier and the tranexamic and protamine guidelines that I will talk about shortly. So this is our patient blood management for cardiac. And it works in so you can actually see it with this slide. Hopefully that's appeared all right. And um, a lot of collaboration and paper reading of all kinds of lab literature, thankfully with some lovely hematologists. Platelet function testing to the lab takes a 30 minute turnaround. You know, sometimes if you ring them first and really hassle them and they're excited, it might be 15, but it takes time. Much better to have it with you um, if that's feasible. I'm not going to talk about this. This is not my area of great knowledge, but it gives you three numbers. One's about ADP. It talks about the effect down on the yellow bit. I've got it on the orange bit. I've got it summarized, clopidogrel and bypass. ASPI obviously talks about aspirin. Some people call it arachidonic acid pathway affected by aspirin and bypass. And the TRAP uh, receptor is looking at, um, at the other inhibitors and like tyrofibane and also affected by low platelet count etc. And a pretty picture of a platelet um, to show that it's got lots of receptors that we don't need to really know about in detail. The lab test comes like this. It's a very clever area under the curve. We only have it between nine and four in hours, but they do it for us. So we were happy to start with that. We use it preoperatively to assess the best time to proceed with surgery. We're using it in theatre to assess the need for platelets and DDAVP. It quantitates the pharmacodynamic effect of the antiplatelet agents, and we're using it on the platelet step of the Rotom algorithm, uh, looking at platelet inhibitors. So that's all I'm going to say really about the multiplate. Um, this sits on the ward where that pre-op yellow bit is, explaining to the JMOs what a hirudin tube is. Now, the more I read about this, the more it has to be done in a hirudin tube. All the studies looking at normal ranges are ranges that predict bleeding or don't predict bleeding in cardiac surgery 
the multi plates all done on a heridin tube. So we had to stock them at various locations. Previously, we only had citrate tubes. And uh, that this is just explaining to them that they take it to level four where the lab is, it's called a multi plate. And just to read the second and third paragraphs, it's useful for clinical significant bleeding in patients on platelet inhibitors. It's usually run in conjunction with the Rotem algorithm because Rotem doesn't detect platelet inhibition from medications very well. Um, I don't know if the road to people will like that sentence, but that's what it says. Multiplate may also be used before cardiac surgery to help the surgeons with timing for semi-urgent. And the rest of it talks about the, to the JMOs about how to collect the blood and to the nurses about how to restock the tubes. So we talked before about this guideline and how we looked at three things we could do better before surgery. And I talked about how we then developed the pre-op intra-op overarching plan um, and worked with the haematologist. So just to talk you through the evidence and what we've done there. Things we could do better, predicting who might need fibrinogen replacement, predicting who might need platelet replacement, predicting best time to operate. Talking about fibrinogen, can we predict bleeding risk in cardiac surgery? Well, of course we can't, but we could try. Um, there is no association particularly between AT APTT, but we check that for everybody, right? And we feel like we're doing something good. Um, there is some correlation between um, fibrinogen levels preoperatively and postoperative bleeding risk. It's the best of the bunch. And we are now starting to test for preoperatively. I'm finding it really interesting. We're going to be auditing it. Certainly, if it's low, like less than two, you've got to worry they're going to bleed. If it's high, like less than four, those patients never bleed. I mean, touch wood, we're auditing it. But I think that um, there's the, the ends of the ranges that fibrinogen preoperatively can give you a wink into how you're going to go. What about our other thing we want to do better preoperatively was looking at time delays. So we had to collaborate with our surgical colleagues on this and um, semi-urgent surgery can be better timed based on platelet function. This is from the European guideline. There's a number of references there that say platelet function testing can be used to guide the timing of surgery. You can look at those references. They relate to the guideline at the corner there. A strategy based on preoperative platelet function testing to determine timing of cabbage, for example, in clopidogrel treated patients led to a 50% shorter wait time for surgical treatment compared to those waiting the five days. So we now use platelet function testing for patients on dual antiplatelets to use that evidence to work out the timing for theta. And also we use it to work out if there's extra patients that need on-site availability of platelets. And it's quite useful. You know, if there's the platelet that you think, the patient that you think you're gonna do them on Saturday, Sometimes you can check this on Thursday afternoon and it's fine and you do them on Friday morning. We, we really are finding that this is a useful test. The other thing we wanted to do better pre-op, working out who does and doesn't need platelets. So this is a little hobby horse of mine. Platelets are a scarce resource. They come from donors. I have to sit on transfusion meetings now. I sat in one where they talked about $75,000 worth of wasted platelets in 2019 and half of that was from cardiac services. So it's a bit horrifying if you care about those kinds of things. Um, so we, we tried to make a plan to have platelets available when we need them and not when we don't. Um, so platelet function testing, it's sent to the lab and we're trying to now use evidence to have them available when we need them and not when we don't. And we did this with the surgeons. So the JMOs now know to order a unit of platelets for high risk surgery. And we are defining that as redo, double procedure. I don't have to tell you this. Aortic surgery, low platelets. If I was still working at St. Vincent's, it would say LVADs and transplants as well. Um, we do this for patients with abnormal platelet function where one or more of the tests is in the red zone as below. We do it for patients on double antiplatelet therapy where we haven't done a platelet function test. So we've now got a bit of an actual plan of who we're gonna organize platelets for and have them on site. And this is how the top of that overarching plan looks, the section that's on the ward. So it talks about fibrinogen being less than two, flag that with the anaesthetic team. Our lab doesn't want to know early if it's likely to be a problem, they're happy to know in the moment. And then this is really about preoperatively, the patients on all these medications, hand delivering this test the day before, aiming for the green zone 24 hours pre-op if you can. That's what the hematologists recommended. And green is go. If it's red, wait two days and check it again. And if it's green, then you can go. And if you must proceed, then clearly they're the patients you need to organize platelets for. And then at the bottom here under high risk cases, obviously we're organizing platelets for those patients as well. So they're the preoperative things we wanted to do better. Predicting, timing, 
and working out who needs platelets. And with this, we're actually getting there. What about during and in surgery and into the ICU period? So we talked about five things that we thought we could do better. Hemodilution, I can cover that in a sentence because it just takes someone in charge to ask everybody to hang a half a litre bag and try not to run it. It's pretty easy to not dilute the patients and the perfusionists will thank you. I'm not going to talk about that anymore. Protamine dosing, tranexamic dosing, we've standardised that and I'll show it to you next. When and how of combining the rodent with the platelet function testing gets tricky. And then the overview page, guiding decisions. This is the five things that we've done better, that we're trying to do better. Tranexamic acid. So at the top of every rodent protocol, it talks about keeping them warm and normal calcemic and all of that. And then it talks about tranexamic acid. What I learned about tranexamic acid, the more I read, the less I knew. There's so much information out there. So we did this largely with the intensivists because they're the ones that are managing the fitting patients. And we did have a few of them. What we've agreed to at this point in time and we're ongoing auditing this is after induction, the patients get 15 milligrams per kilogram of IV infusion over 20 minutes or so at some time before um, bypass. And then usually quite early on, we give it. After the loading dose, we commence an infusion. And the confusion is based on body weight and renal function, and it goes for the duration of surgery. Usually we halve the rate or sometimes stop it to reduce the seizure risk after four hours, although we might continue it if there's fulminant fibrinolysis as shown on the rotum. We're aiming for a maximum of 50 milligrams per kilogram, documenting that the seizure rate with that is 1.4%, which we're accepting of. Patients with fulminant fibrinolysis, we might push it higher, only if there's normal renal function and only in collaboration with ICU. So if you want to go higher, like to 80 milligrams per kilogram as your total dose of tranexamic, you have to talk to your friendly intensivist because they might want to keep them sedated for longer. They might want to run some anticonvulsants. They just need to know that that patient's going to have more like a double incidence, 2.4% of fitting with tranexamic acid. And so we've got a little fold with all this in it in cardiac and the registrars just look at this. A patient weighs 100 kilos, gets 1,500 milligrams of tranexamic acid. And if normal renal function gets 4.5 mils an hour, too easy. Everyone's doing the same thing now. And at, at least then we can uh, audit it and document it and, and see if it's right. Uh, Protamines, the other topic, which I mentioned before, we rationalized this uh, whenever David De Silva was the registrar a couple of years ago and uh, a few years ago now. The EACTA guideline talks about giving too much protamine is an anticoagulant. We all know that. We knew that 20 years ago. But what I didn't realise was that the anticoagulant effect of protamine has a really long half-life. This is not a six-minute event. This is a long event. So you don't want to give more than 1.3 to 1 uh, of the heparin dose. That was associated with more postoperative bleeding in this paper that is referred to here. And obviously, if you're dosing less than 0.6 to 1, you're not reversing your heparin properly. So there's a table that I'll show you on the next page that we have in our theatres. The anaesthetists make sure they go for about 0.8 to 1 and certainly don't go over 1 to 1. You don't want to be giving protamine without any evidence for it. And this is the protocol. It sits in the theatre. It's obvious to most people, but very useful for the registrars. So the dose um, that you are using, we base it on heparin loading dose. The American guidelines talk about body weight, but we just decided to be European on this. So say if I've given 30,000 units of heparin, I'm going to draw up 250 milligrams of protamine, and I'm going to be giving something like that, certainly no more than 300. And then the bit at the bottom is just for the registrars to know when to look at ACTs. So that's the first two bits of the rotom algorithm. So it always starts with tranexamic at the top, and then it talks about protamine and giving the right dose of protamine second. Of course, post bypass if we're bleeding, we don't wait, we go on and we look at the fibrinogen and address that. Um, and we have a dosage table that I'll show you in a size that you can read in a minute. And after you've corrected the fibrinogen and only after you've corrected that, for us fibrinogen equals cryo because we don't have fibrinogen concentrate, then we look at platelets. And we're trying not to give platelets if we don't need to, is the kind of goal. I don't think I need to really explain to you, there are so many meta-analyses and Klaus will probably talk about Here's one example of why we use a rotom algorithm, why we use point of care testing. This meta-analysis showed it reduces FFP, reduces platelets, reduces red cells. We showed some of those things as well in our just local little um, 
one that we did in the blue book. So the evidence supports the use of perioperative point of care testing. And please, please, please to use an algorithm. It supports it if you're using it with an algorithm, not if you're just doing what you feel like and not really double checking it and um, doing it properly. Why do we correct the fibrinogen first? Fibrinogen is the first factor to be depleted during significant bleed. There's one paper quoted here that talks about levels less than 1.5, predicting uh, increased postoperative bleeding. Fibrinogen supplementation has therefore been advocated as a primary hemostatic aim. So we use cryo according to the FibTem on the rotum. We use it first line. And the hematologists are always talking about optimizing fibrinogen. It can make up for mildly impaired platelets. So just kind of changing the way I think about this, that if I can really optimize my fibrinogen, maybe I won't need to use those platelets um, that the surgeon thinks we need. And in theatre, I can check a FibTem, I can check it on rewarming, or I can check it post-protamine. Um, and I'll talk about that in a second. Giving the cryo, often giving DDAVP, just to improve the platelets a bit, without giving platelets. And here's our adult dosage schedule. And um, the children's one is similar, but based on mils per kilo. Essentially, the lower the FibTem, the more that you give. And if your FibTem is catastrophic, you're probably going to need platelets as well. Interestingly, studies show that you don't really want to push your FIB10 over about 15. So we've got 15 as our green zone. And there's an analysis at the, at the bottom there talking about not wanting to push your fibrinogen over 2.8, which equals a FIB10 around 14 or 15 at five minutes because it's not going to have any further benefit. So I showed you the page before that's yellow at the top pre-op, then it goes green, rewarming. Registrars love this. It allows them to follow the case and work out where the rotum fits into everything and how to think about it. So often on rewarming, if it's hard to read, but if cases over 90 minutes on bypass or anyone where you're worried about bleeding or anyone, if you want to, we check a rotum on rewarming. We're looking at the clot strength. We are not looking at clotting times. So for those that don't have one yet, I know there's a few out there, you're never looking at the clotting times on bypass. They'll lead you astray. Um, you're looking at the clot strength at five minutes and the fib tem and the x tem. And this is the way we teach it to the registrars and to the newbies that if the fib tem is a bit low, less than 12, or if the pre op fibrinogen was less than two, and you can see at the bottom of the screen there, they're the same thing. Um, you need to be thinking, I might need cryo for this patient if they bleed. Now, our lab doesn't want to know that straight away. They're happy to know in the moment, but you've got to have your head on as you're rewarming that that's what's going to happen. If your fib is catastrophically low, less than six millimetres at five minutes, or if your fib is all right, so your fibrinogen's all right, but your clot strength is terrible, then you need to have, oh my God, what's happening with my platelets on your mind. And you need to ensure platelet availability. So we would be in the blood bank and just make sure those platelets are there in case we want them early. And this is where you might want to do a multi-plate now, send it up to the lab and let them know you need the result ASAP to see if your platelets are okay. Or you might decide that you want to actually, so here are the options, check it down with a timely result. Or you might decide you're going to give one bag of platelets and then check your multi-plate after that. Or you might decide, depending on how it is, to wait and check it all post-protamine. So this is helping people with their decision tree. Then early post-bypass, nice and pink, no bleeding, no products. If there's bleeding, there's a few obvious things on the left. Referring to the result from your rewarming rotum, if you did one, giving enough cryoprecipitate to correct your fibrinogen deficiency, remembering again that good fibrinogen can compensate for a degree of platelet dysfunction. And if you're worried about that, you should also be giving DDAVP. Now, DDAVP 20 years ago at St. Vincent's, we used to give DDAVP to every single patient coming off bypass. And um, then we didn't use it at all. And now all these guidelines are suggesting that we use it in a targeted fashion. And so here's the list if you can read it. If any of the following apply, long bypass time, they say three hours, but long bypass time, deep hypothermic, renal dysfunction, abnormal multiplate or recent double antiplatelet therapy. Uh, not a bad idea to consider DDAVP as a slow infusion and maybe giving platelets um, if you think they're going to be needed. Or you can wait and give your DDAVP and then check the multiplate. They're the decision trees. DDAVP, this is what I just said, uh, that it's useful in some subgroups. Uh, it doesn't increase the risk of stroke or infarct or thromboembolic complications like some other things do. 
clearly you give it slowly or there's hypotension. So please consider DDAVP when platelet abnormality is suspected and consider platelet function testing to see if it's still needed after DDAVP because you may not need those platelets. And the final part of our overarching um, PBM plan uh, is protamine. So we talked about aiming for 0.8 to 1 for our reversal. Uh, which is what it says here, giving the left column, adding a bit for the pump blood, not giving more than one to one of the dose that you gave to go on bypass. And then post protamine, no bleeding, no products. Check an ACT, noting that too much protamine can also prolong your ACT. Um, checking the rotum, thinking about whether you want to do a multiplate here or a rotum here if you haven't done it already. And then a little bit about tranexamic acid. And if you you don't want to give more than 50 milligrams per kilogram. And if you do, then you need to inform the ICU about the seizure risk. So that's just reminding everybody about that. So the second part of our cardiac rotum algorithm then incorporates the platelet function testing, where once your fibrinogen is normal and you've, you might want to give some desmopressin, which is DDAVP, um, you will be looking at your multiplate, which you might have done on bypass or preoperatively, or maybe you're doing it now, and using that to decide whether or not to give platelets. In terms of the coagulation factors, they're given very, very rarely. And I've got a slide on that next. Hyperfibrinolysis, you're watching the rotum over a long time to see if that's a problem. And then you might be giving, say, a, a nasty dissection. You might then run your tranexamic acid for a longer time until the ICU. And at the bottom, there's a section, what if you're still bleeding? It's a surgical bleed. You're aiming for the green zone of optimal coagulation and thinking about factor seven. So in terms of FFP, that, um, that stage on the pathway, there, this is a Cochrane review, I think it was from 2015. There really is no evidence that prophylactic or therapeutic FFP transfusions reduce blood loss after cardiac surgery. You would only ever use this once they're warm and really if it's rotum guided. Um, otherwise, very rarely given. I think it just overloads the patient to get more bleeding from the uh, right atrial cannulation site, from the stretching atrium. There's retrospective cohorts, I think um, much better to be using uh, prothrombidex in a situation where you really need to be giving something, say a liver impairment patient, where you really want to be using something in this sphere. And then in terms of factor 7a, it's not recommended on any of these guidelines. It should only be considered for uncontrolled bleeding that really can't be managed because it comes with a risk. So just to finish up, reminding you about how we complete our results. We record our results on these labels. It's completed by the registrar with the date and time and circling whether we're on bypass, post bypass, or in the ICU. Uh, we're circling whether we're green and orange, we're completing it with someone else so there's no error. We're sticking it on the back of the chart. And here's one stuck on the back of the chart from a couple of weeks ago. I've rewarmed my patient. We're still on bypass. You can see I've circled here on bypass. You can tell from this, um, everything's in the orange zone. So orange is adequate for hemostasis. And I've written at the bottom, normal rotum, repeated bleeding. I don't think I did a multiplate on that patient. And here's another one, just as one example. This is a cabbage that had a long pump time and had had aspirin up until the day before. And um, this is a, clearly another rotum that was taken on bypass, which you can see because I've circled on bypass and I've written um, that there's a great difference between the intem and the heptem. But you can see here, the nurses come tearing in or the registrar that something's in the red zone. So we know before we're coming off bypass that we've got a fib tem that's low. We're waiting to see if we're gonna have a problem with clinically significant bleeding, which we did. We've also done a multiplate and the multiplate showed that everything was in the green zone. They'd had aspirin the day before, but the arachidonic acid pathway was just normal. And really this is evidence-based and normal is normal, even 21 it's normal. So this patient came off bypass, was bleeding, was given two units of cryoprecipitate, no platelets were required, the bleeding stopped. So this is just an example of how you can manage the fibrinogen and not always need to give platelets, especially feeling very comforted by this. And we're ongoing auditing this because it's done with the best evidence available. We need to every year be looking at the new evidence available on these numbers. They go on the back of the anesthetic chart. This is an old photo. These are the prior labels before the multiplate, but that's how they sit on the back next to the gases. And the other important thing is handing over. So this is a form that Dr. Wolf and my surgeon um, devised to hand over to ICU. 
And the important bit I want to point out is here, it talks about are there any other products reserved for this patient? So if there's platelets, yes, and you've matched them, not matched them, but you know what I mean, got them with their name, I hand that over to the ICU nurse. So this patient, there's platelets reserved for this patient. Before you go off shift, if you're not going to use them, can you please ring the blood bank and release them for some other patient? Uh, and that reduces wastage and stops having to sit in transfusion committee meetings, learning about $75,000 worth of wasted platelets. As we were doing all of this, this practice paper came out. Uh, it's the American equivalent, really. It was released during COVID. But suffice to say, having read this, it doesn't add a lot to the European one. It refers to it. It talks about preoperative platelet function for timing of surgery. It talks about avoiding hemodilution. It talks about continuing tranexamic into ICU if there's fibrinolysis. It talks about always using an algorithm with your rotum. It talks a bit about uh, hemoglobin targets. Avoiding FFP unless it's rotum indicated, as we said. Recommending more DDAVP and less factor 7A. And so we are now going to be auditing this. This has just got through ethics. We're going to have a QR code on each of our rotor machines at the Women's Hospital, the Children's Hospital, and up in Cardiac. So you can QR all the algorithms on your phone. You can answer a brief survey. Bruce Cartwright told me about REDCap and how great it was about five years ago. It's only taken around five years to catch up. But we're going to have the, the open survey there so this data can be collected and we can really uh, audit what we're doing and be having a good look at this and making sure it's right. So finally, what have we learned through all of this saga? We've learned that you need to use an algorithm for those that are not. We've learned that you can collaborate and incorporate Rotom into your MTP. You can incorporate platelet assessment, whatever you've got or buy something. You can collaborate within cardiothoracic to get the pre-op JMOs, talking to the surge regs with the timing, and also talking with ICU afterwards about tranexamic and continuing it. We can all work together to have one pathway. You can ensure good documentation, and clearly I'm an ad advocate of the stickers to reduce individual variability and error. I've seen smart people make mistakes, really smart ones, and then you need to order what you're doing and make sure that it's current ongoing. And thank you for your time. And I'm thank not doing you so any much, exams. Dr. Down. <laughs> you are welcome. That was great. Um, I will turn it over now to Dr. Gorlinger. Thank you. We do so have a few questions already. We have a, a, a several questions. So um, we'll save those till the end till you're both finished. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, um, I hope you can see my slides already. Uh, and yes. I uh, cannot agree enough what uh, uh, Catherine said in particular. Uh, what, what we usually say, it's a four, four or five C's, which is coagulation, communication, collaboration, consensus, and check, which is more or less the same uh, what she said, that of course you have to develop a protocol um, you uh, have to communicate it with your colleagues, you have, uh, which is very, very important to um, have a consensus, for example, within the blood transfusion or PBM committee that uh, everybody is on the same page. Uh, and of course, you have to check if uh, your protocol or your uh, um, algorithm is effective. And uh, we did this already in, in Essen for some years. So we started in 1998 uh, with the rotor management, first in liver transplant, and then some years later in other settings like cardiovascular trauma, uh, also pediatrics, hepatology, uh, obstetrics. So you heard already about my background, so we can make this short. And of course, the most important for conflict of interest is that since July 2012, I'm the global medical director of uh, TEM Innovations, uh, which is now part uh, of Werfen. And um, yeah, I think uh, Catherine ad addressed this already quite nicely that of course we have to uh, think about the right questions to ask. 
so just to run a road term is, is not sufficient. We have to think about what is our question. Do we want to predict bleeding the day before surgery? And she said already, this is uh, quite difficult. Uh, because the positive predictive value of Rotem, but also of standard lab tests is quite low. But she also pointed out that the most important uh, preoperative test might be the fibrinogen level. And in patient with uh, uh, antiplated drugs on board, uh, the plated functionality. Um, I embedded some poll questions within my presentation. So that means uh, it would be nice if you can just uh, take your smartphone and uh, go to this page because then you get the poll question directly sent to your smartphone and there you just have to uh, click on the answer you think is adequate. So I just wait uh, a minute that you have the chance to, to enter this link. You don't have to download an app or something like this is just uh, enter this into your browser. It's a uh, poll everywhere. So pollead.com e and then slash Klaus G428. So I can just give you some more seconds to, to enter this to your smartphone. And then we can directly see the answers also um, within the presentation. So I just give you some more seconds and it will also be mentioned on the poll questions. So, okay, I hope you had the chance to, to enter this. And we just start with, with not the first poll question, but the first question we have as a clinician, and that's why does my patient bleed? So now we are not anymore in prediction. We have already the bleeding situation, which you will see is always the first clinical question in the algorithm. And what we know is from a lot of setting, if that's cardiac surgery or trauma or obstetrics, that of course, a lot of bleeding is surgical bleeding. And that's important to discriminate. And when we look at the left picture, Usually I said, uh, when the blood comes up to the face of the surgeon, it's usually a surgical bleeding from a high pressure area. And here we have a hole in the aorta, but uh, the, the colleague from a surgical field has already the finger on the hole. We take the picture, he makes a suture and more or less a problem is solved. It's different on the right side, uh, which we call the blood on floor syndrome, which is quite often a combination of both surgical and coagulopathic bleeding. Uh, and that also means that a long discussion between surgeon and anesthesiologist, whether this is surgical or coagulopathic bleeding is not very helpful for the patient. So that is uh, definitely a situation where we have to work closely together and running a rotum analysis and also a plated function test can be very helpful to identify the real reason for bleeding. The other question is, of course, how to fix it. Because just to know that there is bleeding or there's coagulopathic bleeding, uh, there are, let's say, more historically ways to, to deal with that. And that is just to refill. And that's still quite often done, in particular in centers in the US where they say, okay, if the patient is bleeding, so the patient is losing whole blood, we just replace whole blood. And you can use real whole blood or you can reconstitute whole blood by, uh, by a mixture of red blood cells, plasma and platelets. Uh, but we learned this is quite often not very effective um, because if the holes are still there, bleeding will continue. So option two, and I think there's a much better op option, is to identify the holes and close the holes. And that's what we are doing with uh, point of care testing to identify what is the real reason for bleeding. And then the therapy of bleeding is not transfusion, it's to stop the bleed. And that's also the reason why we are using point of care testing in major surgery, if that's cardiac surgery or, or trauma or obstetrics. So here we have to understand the rotum guided bleeding management as an essential part of patient blood management, in particular, the second pillar, which is minimize bleeding and blood loss. But it's not about 
blood transfusion. Of course, it's very good if we can reduce blood transfusion. We can also reduce the wastage of blood products. But finally, it's about patient safety. And that's not a new idea. That's something which was already uh, discussed by Hippocrates two and a half thousand years ago, where he said that, of course, as physicians, we want to cure, but maybe it's even more important to avoid additional harm. And we know that, of course, in severe bleeding, blood transfusion can be life-saving. But on the other hand, uh, an inappropriate blood transfusion can also uh, induce harm. And that's the reason why we developed algorithms. So in our institution, in essence, we even then uh, modified the algorithms uh, that they fit at the best to the different clinical settings. So there's a cardiovascular algorithm, uh, a liver transplant algorithm. And uh, when you look at the details, so the structure is all the same. On the left side, we have the ROTAM and plated function testing results. On the right side, we have the corresponding intervention that the cutoff values are not always the same uh, because we learned that, uh, for example, liver patients tolerate lower levels of hemostasis compared to cardiovascular. And even within cardiovascular, it makes a difference if that is cabbage or it's a uh, major aortic surgery because then they are more close even to the trauma or obstetric algorithm. But uh, these algorithms are not any more just, um, let's say, an idea of uh, somebody who is an enthusiast in, in bleeding management in between. There's a lot of evidence behind these algorithms. And uh, you can find here, uh, just in this uh, review paper, describing these four algorithms. That's based on uh, 240 key references. So it's a lot of evidence behind and that I want to present uh, in, in some cases uh, during this presentation. Also, the algorithms are in between in, in medical textbooks or so quite established. So this one, uh, our cardiac algorithm, uh, has been published six years ago in the Clinical Care Handbook of Massachusetts General Hospital. Uh, and it's uh, like uh, Catherine already presented, it's a step-by-step -step protocol, which also means that sequence matters. And the first question in all the algorithms is the clinical situation. So do we have diffuse bleeding and is an intervention needed? If this question is answered with no, we don't do an intervention, which means we don't treat numbers, we only treat a bleeding patient. Of course, we think about the need of uh, antifibrolytics, and I think that was already very good, well covered uh, in, in the talk from Catherine. Uh, then we look at ACT, of course, after winning from bypass, and if ACT is prolonged, we use the ROTEM to identify why it's prolonged. Is that really a residual happen effect, or is it a protein overdose, or it's a low fibrinogen, or it's a deficiency of enzymatic factors. Uh, because to answer all prolonged ACTs with more protein might not really be an adequate intervention. And then the next step is to look at clot firmness. So we use the combination of uh, XTEM and FIPTEM amplitude after five minutes. And uh, you may see here, we, we use a little bit more restricted numbers for cardiac so just uh, below 30 millimeters in XTEM combined with below 9 millimeters in FIPTEM. And the numbers in brackets, that's more for major aortic surgery because they usually need more. But also, Kathleen already addressed that uh, going higher than 15 to 16 millimeters in FIPTEM usually does not provide any additional value. And that's uh, based on studies from Marco Ranucci. And we use this dosing table. And uh, as you may know, in, in Germany, there's no cryoprecipitate anymore available since about 20 years. Uh, so we always work with uh, fibrinogen concentrate. And if uh, FIPTEM is high enough, uh, but still XTEM is too low, then we have to think about plated function. And uh, then we mainly look at the uh, ADP test or TRAP test here, that's a cut of values of the root and platelet. They are not exactly the same as for multiplate because, you know, in multiplate, you use aggregation units. With root and platelets, you use uh, physical uh, numbers um, in ohm a minute. 
uh, but uh, it's, it correlates uh, quite well. And we don't use here the ARA TEM uh, because we, we learned that after about half an hour of cardiopulmonary bypass, that's in most cases already quite low. So ADP and TRAP have a better predictive value uh, for bleeding. And only if clot firmus is fine, and this is just a reminder here that in the protocol it's mentioned that A5 and symptom is higher than nine, then we look at the clotting time. And if the clotting time is higher than 80 and we have a significant bleeding, then we consider to give a four factor protamine complex concentrate or fresh frozen plasma. But uh, usually we, we use uh, PCC in this indication. So actually our plasma transfusion rate in our hospital in cardiac surgery is 0.2%. Um, and there are some really rare cases where we have a problem of a prolonged interim clotting time. Most often in cardiac surgery, that's really a protamine overdose because um, factors from the intrinsic pathway, like factor eight, are very quick, quick acute phase reactants. So that means they go up quickly. And at the end of cardiac surgery, it's usually at 150 to 200% of normal. And then after each intervention, uh, we give every intervention about 10 to 15 minutes time to work. And we have to double check in particular from a clinical situation. So if bleeding stops, it's fine. If not, we take a new blood sample and run the protocol again. So the key message here is that we have to understand a rotem algorithm as a not to do algorithm because we use the high negative predictive value to step by step exclude reasons for bleeding. And of course, we can also adapt this to the pediatric population. Usually, based on the studies uh, which have been done, again, the pediatric population tolerates usually a little bit lower uh, clot firmness. But the most important point I already addressed by, by Catherine is that, of course, dosing must be much more precise in the pediatric population. So it's not always uh, correct to give uh, one unit or one vial. Uh, we have to base it on, on the body weight. Um, I mentioned also already that there are, or even in cardiovascular surgery, patients who go to the other direction, and that is a major and complex uh, uh, aortic arch surgery, where you see then we go to a little bit higher levels which are uh, yeah, uh, very close to the cutoff values also used in, in Catherine's uh, algorithm. So just to summarize the concept of a rotium guided patient blood management, what we want to do is to administer right hemostatic drug or intervention in the right dose at the right time and in the right sequence. And we want to avoid any inappropriate transfusion or hemostatic intervention. And this can be done again by using the high negative predictive value of Rotem, which is 90 to 96%. So if, for example, the FIPTEM is 15, uh, we can exclude that this patient will benefit from more fibrinogen uh, replacement, or if the uh, overall clot firmness uh, is fine and platelet function testing is fine, the patient will not benefit from platelet transfusion. Of course, time is important in severe bleeding, and that's something also if you implement a, a point of care protocol or any rotum protocol, even if the devices are placed in the lab, it's very important to discuss that the results must be available in a short time uh, to the clinician. Uh, it doesn't really help if the, if the results are very precise, but you get them one hour later, because then you have to do a decision in between. So that means, again, in particular, if the device is placed in the lab, it's important that you have, for example, remote viewing available, that you can have a look at the running uh, um, analysis during the analysis um, and not have to wait that somebody is calling you or half an hour or 45 minutes later. Catherine already addressed the importance of the heparin protamine management. What we here see are just three different cases. In the first one, we see a prolongation of the clotting time in intem to more than 600 seconds. And also the increasing clot firm is very slowly. That can be an anticoagulant but that can also affect the deficiency. But by running heptem, we see we more or less normalize 
the clotting time. So that shows this is definitely a residual happen effect and giving some more protamine makes sense. In the second case, that's a typical situation on bypass then usually, of course, it doesn't make a lot of sense to run an intem. Of course, if you work with, with a Sigma, with a cartridge, there's always an intem on board, but don't be surprised if you get a flat line, just to compare to the Tech 6S, you get three flat lines because the function of and the rapid tech and the Carline tech has no heparin inhibitor. So that is a big disadvantage of the Tech 6S system on bypass. And therefore they don't recommend to do an analyze on bypass, you always have to wait until weaning from bypass and giving protamine. But I think in very complex uh, procedures, the, the analyze on bypass, as Catherine already mentioned, can give you important information, in particular, if you work with cryoprecipitate, which always takes some time to prepare. And what we see in the last case here, where even the heptam clotting time is longer than the intem clotting time, that's a typical picture of a protamine overdose, uh, which is not always characterized by, by a longer heptam than intem, sometimes just both are significantly prolonged. And even longer, if you measured on bypass before, then the heptam clotting time is after protamine even longer than before protamine. So what is the evidence um, behind the ratio uh, already mentioned also by, by Catherine. And that's here a study from Yuko Ichikawa from Japan, uh, where they said, okay, they consider NT10A activity as a gold standard for heparin concentrations, but this is quite often not 24 seven and within 10 to 15 minutes available. So in this study, they measured NT10A activity and looked which of their other measurements come close to the NT10A activity. They also use the HEPCON HMS system, which did not correlate to NT10A at all. The ACT had an R of 0.12, which means not really a good correlation, which is not a big surprise because ACT is designed for high heparin concentrations that we can even get a number on bypass. Uh, APTT is also not very good. Correlation coefficient is 0.36. And the intem to heptam clotting time ratio is, has an R value of 0.72, which is a quite good correlation. And the other important message uh, they, they published was that if you have a heparin concentration after weaning from bypass, which is below 0.2 nt 10 a units, and this correlates to a 1.2 to 1.25 in interim heptam clotting time ratio, that this is not associated with bleeding. So if we have a very small residual heparin effect, it's even better than giving protamine and go to the other side and have a protamine overdose. And this has been even tested in two randomized trials. This is one from Amsterdam, uh, where they compared giving a high protein to heparin ratio, which was a one to one, or a low protein heparin to heparin ratio, was about 0.6 to 0.7. And uh, we see that this have definitely an impact also on the transfusion requirements, because there was with a higher protein dose, uh, a significant higher transfusion requirement, which went up for red blood cells from 19 to 32% of the patient population, for plasma from zero to 11%, and for platelets from six to 21%. Why was those cells so strong for platelets? What has been shown was that protamine, in particular protamine overdose, does not only block factor five, which is the accelerator of factor 10. It also results in significant plated inhibition. That's a triple antiplated inhibition, the achrodonic pathway, ADP pathway, and thrombin pathway. So it's even worse compared to not stopping a dual antiplated therapy. And when we look here at clinical outcome uh, as a retoracotomy rate, it went up from two to 9%. So usually our surgical colleagues are for more protein because they don't want to go back to theater, but you see that you have nearly a five-fold increase to have, that you have to go to back to theater due to bleeding if you use a protein overdose. The other quite interesting information, and this is here from a hospital specialized on pediatric cardiac surgery, is that 
In patients with a prolonged ACT, the most often reason in the pediatric population was a low fibrinogen. And that's also not a big surprise because we know, of course, dilution happens much more often in the pediatric population. And uh, you see here the FIPTAM in mean was only 4.4 millimeters uh, with the A10 value. So that means something of, of four for A52. And that means uh, giving more protamine definitely doesn't uh, fix this issue. They need a higher fibrinogen concentration. So the key message is protamine is not vitamin P. Uh, so protamine overdose really matters. And that brings me to the first um, poll question. So uh, the question is ACT cannot be prolonged due to heparin. So it's a not question. Heparin, protamine, low fibrinogen, high platelets, or intrinsic factor deficiency? So we give just some seconds time, but um, uh, there seems to be a quite clear agreement. And um, I agree also with this. So we know, yes, of course, residual heparin effect can prolong the ACT, but protein overdose too. Low fibrinogen, in particular in the pediatric population, if we have an uh, intrinsic factor deficiency, which is quite rare, as mentioned before, because factor eight is going up during cardiac surgery, uh, it's rare, but of course, high platelets uh, don't prolong. ACT. Um, yeah. Okay. So now we move to clot firmness management. And you know, um, historically, tech protocols just use the, the Kaolin tech and, and try to use uh, um, maximum amplitude and alpha to discriminate between low platelets and fibrinogen. If you would use a mono assay approach on Rotem, you would have the same issue. And you can see if we just focus on XTEM here, in the first case, the amplitude after five minutes is uh, 23 millimeters, and the second case is 24 millimeters. So only have the XTEM available. It's quite difficult to differentiate between a fibrinogen deficiency and thrombocytopenia. But the combination of XTEM and FIPTEM make this very easy because we see in the first case here that the FIPTEM amplitude after five minutes is only two millimeters. So that proves that the reduced clot firmness in XTEM is based on a fibrinogen deficiency. Where in the second case, we have a FIPTEM A5 of 15 millimeters. So we would be even happy in major aortic surgery or in obstetric hemorrhage. So reduced clot firmness in XTEM must be based on a low platelet contribution. So again, this combination makes interpretation uh, quite easy. But what is the evidence behind and why are we using specific cutoff values? And this is a study already published several years ago from Kivan Kakuti from uh, General. Uh, hospital in Toronto. And you see that's not really a small study. There's more than 1,000 patients. And uh, the question in this study was, uh, can we predict with a post cardiopulmonary bypass fibrinogen level, the probability of transfusion of five or more units of red blood cells? Um, what they showed was that after weaning from bypass, fibrinogen level is only 0.5 gram per liter. 60% of the patient needs five or more units of red blood cells. If it's one, it's 40%. If it's 1.5, it's a little bit more than 20%. If it's two, it's yeah, about 14%. Uh, but then you see, even if fibrinogen level is increasing, there is not a big uh, additional value. And uh, that's the way how we use cutoff values. That means if we have a fibrinogen level below 1.5 gram per liter after weaning from bypass, and we have bleeding, yes, to increase the fibrinogen level from less than 1.5 to 2 to 2.5 uh, makes sense. And uh, this corresponds very well, again, with a FIPTEM A5 or A10 value. Uh, here, they're using Canada A10 because like in the US, um, A5 was not already FDA approved. Uh, we are just working with the FDA study, which just finalized 
uh, on this band, you see uh, that an Fabian of below 1.5 corresponds to a FIPTEM value of about eight millimeters. And quite interesting, this is a study from, from Marco Ranucci published recently in um, uh, small infants below 10 kilograms undergoing cardiac surgery. And you see that more or less they end up with the same cutoff value. So that means there's even not so big difference uh, between the cutoff values we have in pediatric and adult cardiac surgery. Uh, of course, the size of the procedure is different. The blood volume is different. And of course, the dosing has to be adapted. Um, with this study, we're coming back to the, to the study I, I mentioned already. And these are more than 1,000 patients. And they also were running here a rock curve analysis. Uh, and what they showed is that you can really reliable use already the FIPTEM uh, measurement done on cardiopulmonary bypass uh, during complete anticoagulation and predict the postoperative uh, fibrinogen concentration. Because, of course, you cannot run. Uh, the clause method on bypass because usually there is no heparin inhibitor in this test system. And when you get these rock curve analyzes, of course, there is uh, a an, an statistically optimum cutoff value, which is below or equal to nine millimeters, but you can always play a little bit on this rock curve analyzes. If you want to have a higher sensitivity. So using, for example, the cut of uh, below 12, then of course you have a little bit higher sensitivity, but a less specificity, or you can also move in the other direction. So that depends on the availability of the products. And also if you want to be more proactive or more restrictive. And this had also impact on the ACTA recommendation. So there are two recommendations which have been published after uh, the uh, PBM guidelines from 2017. Here is one recommendation about the role of fibrinogen and also fibrinogen replacement. So in this guideline, they clearly recommend to assess the fibrinogen level using viscoelastic testing in cardiac surgery. They don't recommend anymore the clause method uh, for intraoperative and postoperative testing for several reasons. First, the turnaround time is much longer for the clause method. Second, and there are inter-assay variabilities. And third, maybe most important, the high heparin concentrations in particular on bypass don't allow to use the clause method in a reproducible way. So there's a lot of interference between high heparin concentrations and the results. And finally, they just state that uh, um, replacing fibrinogen does not seem to increase adverse outcomes in particular if you guide it uh, by Rotem. So you also avoid an, an overdose. There's even recently published from London, a randomized trial using Rotem in neonatal and infant cardiac surgery. Uh, and that was also about dosing. First of all, of course, you can identify the patient with a low fibrinogen, but we addressed already that dosing is important and in particular important in neonates and small infants. And you see that the dose range can be quite high dependent on the result. So between 50 and 200 milligrams per kilogram. And what this study showed was that uh, using uh, the, the FIPTEM and a dose calculation based on FIPTEM, nearly all the patient after one intervention could be uh, um, brought to, to the area of 1.5 to 2.5 gram per liter. So dosing also in neonates and small infants could be done in a very precise way. So it brings us to the second poll question. So again, it's a not question. So which statement is not correct? Uh, first, uh, fibrinogen dose calculation can be done based on FIPTEM results in cardiac surgery in adults. B, fibrinogen dose calculation can be done based on FIPTEM in cardiac surgery in infants and neonates. C, Fibrinogen dose calculation is not needed since plasma transfusion is the most effective way to restore fibrinogen plasma concentration. D, 
plasma fibrinogen concentration below 150 milligrams per deciliter or FIPTAM A5 below eight is associated with increased bleeding in adult cardiac surgery and E plasma fibrinogen concentration below 150 milligrams per deciliter or FIPTAM um, should be below eight uh, is associated with increased bleeding in infants and neonates. Yeah, I see already that uh, we have uh, yeah. Most of you say that C is not correct. The last one is a mistake from my side. It should be here below eight millimeters. Um, yeah, and I, I agree with the majority of you. Uh, and we will discuss this, that uh, plasma transfusion is uh, definitely not a uh, very effective way to increase the fibrinogen concentration because a plasma or the fibrinogen concentration in plasma uh, is quite low. So the only way to increase fibrinogen is cryoprecipitate or fibrinogen concentrate. Um, yeah, now we go to trombin and generation management, and that's not something we, we see on the first view, because clot firm is here is fine, and we just see a prolongation of the clotting time in the extrinsic pathway. So here is nearly 120 seconds, and uh, this was a patient on buffering. So by giving a four-factor PCC, we go down to 70 seconds. But we learned also in a severe dilution, uh, where not only the fibrinogen level is diluted, that the next factors which are going down is factor two, factor 10, and factor seven, where, again, factor eight is uh, increasing as an acute phase reactant. So there was a study some years ago from Annabel Blasi from Barcelona. That was in patients treated with vitamin K antagonists, and they get some PCC uh, to uh, yeah, reduce the INR below 1.5, but they didn't want to wait again or an hour to, to start surgery. So what they did in this study, they were running both the extem clotting time and INR, and they were looking for the best cutoff in extem CT to characterize an INR below or higher than 1.5. And in their study, the cutoff value was 84 seconds. And that means that if the clotting time uh, was um, higher than 84 seconds, then in 93%, the INR was higher than 1.5. And if it was below 84 seconds, the INR was in 100% below 1.5. So you see the area under the curve in the rock curve analysis was 0.998. So that means there's a very good discrimination uh, between both. The other point was we discussed what is really the efficiency of fresh frozen plasma in cardiac surgery. And that has been assessed in several studies. And here's a Cochrane meter analyze from about uh, six years ago, which included 15 randomized trials and the maybe surprising or not surprising result was that transfusion with fresh frozen plasma was inferior to control for preventing patients receiving any red blood cell transfusion. So it was even 2.6 times more. And the main reason is first, uh, fresh frozen plasma, again, is not very effective uh, to treat the coagulopathy in cardiac surgery, but it's very effective to dilute the hemoglobin level. And whatever cutoff value you use to transfuse red blood cells, if that is 7, 7.5, 8, or 9, you will reach this level earlier if you treat your patients with plasma. And that results in more red blood cell transfusion. And uh, the main question, of course, is, okay, uh, is that just a dilution or that does it also, or is it also associated with more complications? And uh, this is an interesting study from Italy, again, where they used a rotem guided protocol in a major open thoracoabdominal aortic aneurysm repair. Uh, it was a, a cohort study, not a randomized trial, uh, but we see that before implementing Rotem, nearly everybody 
got fresh frozen plasma, 97%. After implementing the Rotem protocol, it's 35%. As mentioned, in our institution, it's actually nearly 0%, because if we have an issue, we mainly fix it with Fabrinogen concentrate or PCC. But the important point was that also before implementing a rhodium guided protocol and avoiding plasma transfusion nearly all the patients, also nearly all patients had pulmonary complications, 83%, which dropped down to 44% in the rotem group. So to avoid unnecessary plasma transfusion seems to be also associated with less pulmonary complications due to trolley or TACO. And at the same time, there was a significant cost reduction. Sorry, so Dr. Is, Berlinger, just a yeah. five minute reminder. Yes. Okay, so yeah, I, I speed up a little bit. Uh, um, so what is the alternative? Of course, when we know fibrinogen is low, yes, it's cry precipitate or fibrinogen concentrate, which should be used first line. In uh, patients where we really have a problem with thrombin generation, it's not based on heparin, protamine, or low fibrinogen. There are several studies now showing that there are some advantages using a PCC. And here in this systematic review and meta-analysis shows you based on three studies that uh, red blood cell transfusion incidence and um, uh, amount could be reduced significantly with no additional thromboembolic events. And also this has impact on the recently published uh, um, recommendations from EACTA again. Now it's about the use of four-factor PCC that in massively bleeding patient with coagulopathy, so that means you have to identify that there is a coagulopathy and in particular a problem with thrombin generation. You can use an initial bolus of 25 units per kilogram. Um, what we do also in our algorithm to start a little bit more careful, even with the smaller dose, because most of cardiac patients have also some risk of thromboembolic complications, and we more or less then titrate uh, the effect. The interesting part is the characterization of the diagnostic test, and it says it must be tissue factor activated, factor seven dependent and heparin insensitive point of care test, which exactly characterize the XTEM test. Uh, so, you know, for example, the Repitec from, from Hemonetics is a combination of kaolin and tissue factor and several studies showed that you cannot guide PCC administration with Repitec. So what is the required viscoelastic reagent composition to guide PCC in cardiac surgery? And the same applies for trauma. Is it A, kaolin plus heparinase? Is it B, tissue factor and kaolin? Is it C, tissue factor, of course not fissue factor, uh, and polybrain or heparin inhibitor, tissue factor and kaolin and abcipsimab, or allergic acid and heparinase? Yeah, just go through the possibility. So here we are for what is the right composition. So if we use kaolin plus heparinase, we cannot see the extrinsic pathway because now we're just looking at the intrinsic pathway. So uh, A is not uh, uh, adequate. Tissue factor and kaolin, that is a combination in rapid tech. As I mentioned, uh, several studies showed that using both extrinsic and intrinsic activation, you cannot guide PCC. So the right one is C, tissue factor and polybrain. Well, that's a combination you have in XTEM. Um, polybrain is important to eliminate the heparin effect because otherwise it can also prolong uh, the clotting time. And um, tissue factor and kaolin and abcipsimab, that would be the combination of functional fibrinogen. Um, but this, again, a combination of tissue factor and kaolin doesn't work. And elagic acid and heparinase, that would be the heptam. Again, it's also not adequate because we are looking at the intrinsic pathway. Um, but PCC contains the factors of the extrinsic pathway. 
So coming to the last part, hypercoagulability and thrombosis, that's what we want to avoid. And there is already a quite old study from adult cardiac surgery or a cardiovascular disease showing that the XTEM cutoff with an MCF or of higher than 68 millimeters have a very high sensitivity and specificity of 94% to predict thrombosis. FIPTEM is not at the same level, which means if FIPTEM is high just to compensate for low platelet count, it seems not to be associated with a high level of thrombosis. But anyway, we learned that we don't have to target these high levels of more than 20 millimeters because they have at least no benefit. The interesting point again here, when we look at the neonates and infants, again in a study from Harvard University, that prediction of thrombosis ends up with very similar cutoff values as in adults. So XTEM MCF, it's here 69 millimeters, in adults was 68. And for FIPTEM, it's 22, and in adults was 24. So again, a very close uh, situation between even neonates, infants, and adults also for the prediction of thrombosis. There have been several randomized studies done also in a pediatric population. We don't have the time to go into details, but also these randomized studies showed that implementing a ROTEM-guided uh, protocol reduces intraoperative blood loss, transfusion requirements, and duration at critical care. Uh, this has been also confirmed uh, recently by another study here from India in 170 uh, pediatric transgenital cyanotic surgical patients. And again, there was a significant reduction in blood loss and blood component therapy, and also the reduced duration of mechanical ventilation, ICU and hospital stay. So again, by avoiding unnecessary, in particular, plasma and platelet transfusion, we have also the possibility to use pulmonary complications, and by doing so, the time on mechanical ventilation and ICU. So I think for time reasons, we, we skip this question and uh, just come to, to one meta analyze. That's the most recent one published uh, one year ago. There was a, a Cochrane analysis in 2016, already based on 17 RCTs and 1,500 patients showing for the first time a significant reduction in mortality with the latest R, uh, meta analyzed based on 21 randomized trials and now nearly 9,000 patients shows that there's a borderline result on tech but a significant result on ROTEM. And you see here, there's more or less a 50% reduction uh, in mortality. And even if we take tech and ROTEM together, it's uh, still significant. And uh, similar results have been shown for the incidence of acute kidney injury. When we look at tech studies, there's not a big difference. Uh, but again, looking at ROTEM, we have a risk ratio of 0.49, so 50% reduction in acute kidney injury. And I think the difference is mainly based on different algorithms, not maybe so much on different devices, but uh, historically tech algorithms focus mainly on plasma and platelet transfusion, where Rotem algorithms are, have a different sequence and favor uh, fibrinogen replacement, PCC, and are very restrictive with plasma and platelets. Uh, why is this important? Um, several studies show when we look at long-term mortality after cardiac surgery, that the avoidance of acute kidney injury is very important for long-term outcome. And if we here just look at five-year survival, you see that in patients where we avoid acute kidney injury after cardiac surgery, more than 90% of our cardiac patients survive the next five years where if we have any acute kidney injury after cardiac surgery, or maybe only two days on dialysis, um, the survival drops down to 70%. So that means if we don't avoid acute kidney injury, 20% of our cardiac patients will die in the next five years. But this is, of course, not so often recognized because there are not so many studies looking at long-term mortality. Um, but there is, uh, uh, two years ago, uh, another group from, from Germany uh, published this randomized trial, and it's based on three big centers. It's a, a German heart center in Leipzig, Berlin, and Hamburg. Uh, 
And what they found out in the randomized trial was that in particular, patients with a long cardiopulmonary bypass time, more than 150 minutes, benefit from rotem management. Of course, if there is no bleeding, there's not really a benefit. Uh, but in this patient population, they showed that Rotem significantly reduced 24-hour drainage loss. And this is, I think, the important point. It's the first study looking at five-year mortality, which dropped down in the randomized trial from 15 to 0%. So I think this is definitely an important message. And at the same time, were again, a significant reduction in costs. So again, this has impact on guidelines, of course, the European guidelines. And uh, again, Catherine already pointed out that it's not enough to run a test. You have to implement an algorithm, which should be reasonable. And uh, she also mentioned already the recommendation from the Society of Cardiovascular Anesthesiologists, also from the US, which comes very close to the European situation, where even also in their, in their um, recommendations, they publish also a Rotem guided protocol uh, using very similar cutoff values. And also here already the heptem to intem ratio uh, we usually use it the other way around in temp to have time ratio. So just to summarize, uh, I think, uh, yes, um, it's important to use point of care testing in particular in bleeding patient undergoing cardiovascular surgery. Uh, we should not panic. We should also not have the reflex that every prolonged ACT should be answered by more protamine because that can result in just the opposite, more bleeding. So we have to keep calm, measure, do a, a, a rational decision and stop bleeding and avoid thrombosis. And thank you for your attention and open for questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Gorlinger. I'm sorry that we were getting a bit short on time there, but we do have a bunch of questions. So I will start and hopefully we can get through them kind of quickly since we're over time a bit. Um, the first one was for Dr. Downs. It says, good evening, Catherine. Thank you for your interesting presentation. If there is no point of care testing for platelet function testing in the hospital, could I use FibTem to assess platelet function instead? If not, what's your suggestion? Thank you. Um, I would think that you need to start a conversation with the hematologists and see if they have something in their lab that you could use. Um, obviously, you can't use FibTem to look at platelet function. You're looking at your XTEM using the algorithm. Um, start a conversation with your hematologist. Find out who runs your transfusion committee and see if you can get access like we did. Perfect, thank you. Um, next question um, was also from Dr. Downs's talk. What fluids do you give if the patient is bleeding and the rotum is normal? Um, so post bypass, normally we give the pump blood left over from bypass. And by then we've got a result and we know what we're doing. And then we run some albumin commonly as we're leaving the theater. It'd be our most common routine and sometimes a couple of units of cryoprecipitate in the middle if it's indicated. Perfect, and if anyone has further questions to your original questions, feel free to um, pop them in the chat. Um, the next one also from your talk, Dr. Downs, um, is this data all from Rotem Delta or the Sigma? Oh, we don't have a Sigma. So you might've missed the start of the talk where I said that we never had a Delta, we're relative newbies. And we, we started our journey when Sigma came to Australia in 2015. Wonderful, thank you. Um, next one also from your talk, Dr. Downs, how much of the reduction in blood product usage comes from the use of the algorithm compared to the waiting to see if the patient is bleeding? Well, that's a great question. And, um, you know, the intensivists all say, well, is it the algorithm or is it that you're using more cryo than what you're used to? And of course, you can't separate this. In places that don't have access to this technology, if they just use cryoprecipitate as first line and didn't use FFP, they'd probably be doing better if there was a cardiac unit that didn't have this. How much of it is from which? Well, 
you know, evidence-based is always best if you can do that. And of course, I can't answer that question. Whoever wrote that, it's um, it's quite cheeky. But if you don't have, if you're writing that because you don't have access to this technology, then I would think running first with cryoprecipitate, looking at your preoperative fibrinogens would be a good way to work out where to go first. Yeah, maybe I can just add something to, to this question. Uh, so, of course, most of the um, randomized trials, because we know that having a protocol is always better than having no protocol, usually have in the control group also an algorithm based on standard lab tests or whatever is available to this hospital. And then these studies showed that using Rotram results were significantly superior to a uh, uh, a standard lab algorithm. Um, the other point is that, of course, even or some people said, okay, if fibrinogen is always uh, low, why are we not giving fibrinogen to everybody? But these randomized trials, uh, if they have been done in cardiac surgery or in obstetrics or in trauma, uh, didn't end up with a significant improvement. And I think the reason for that is that a lot of bleeding is surgical bleeding, and we cannot treat surgical bleeding uh, with, uh, with fibrinogen replacement. Uh, so that means, uh, again, I think we, we should use a ROTEM algorithm at a not-to-do protocol. And very important point is also to identify non-coagulopathic bleeding. And this patient will not benefit from plasma or platelets or fibrinogen or PCC or Rickman factor 7a. They just need uh, maybe a suture, a clip or something like this. And what our cardiac surgeons learned was that if we said, sorry, there is no coagulopathy, they maybe had to look, say, the heart again, looking at the anastomosis on the backside of the heart. And nobody likes to look, say, the heart after, after winning from bypass, but they always find something. Um, and that means that's much better than closing the chest, sending the patient to the ICU, and maybe half an hour, one hour later, the patient is coming back, even with a maybe pericard tamponade. And then you have to do the same uh, in, in a very bad condition of the patient. So it's, it's very important also to identify the non-coagulopathic bleeding and to fix this problem before the, the chest is closed. Okay, thank you to you both for that. Um, the next uh, two questions come from the same person. Question one, are cardiothoracic anesthesia group variable use the variably use the Atakus dosing or pharmacokinetic dosing for TXA, uh, 12.5 per kilogram, then 6.5 per kilogram per hour. Any reason to recommend one or the other? So I think um, when like I said, the more I read about tranexamic, the less I knew. And the seizure risk, it's more about the total dose and about renal impairment. So as long as you're doing something that comes within the 50 milligrams per kilogram and you're not giving big, you know, you're not coming close to that or giving bigger than that in people with renal impairment, lots of different regimes will achieve the same endpoint. So that those particular numbers came from um, the pharmacokinetics done by the company looking at blood levels and, um, and we just removed the column for EGFR less than 29. So that's one way of achieving it, but there's many ways of achieving it. You just need to know your seizure risk. So we do about 600 cases a year. And last year we had five or six fitters. So we're coming in under 1.4%. I think we're doing okay. So just so that you can know what your total dose is and know that people are doing the same thing and they're all coming in in a safe dosage range. I also agree. I think uh, for me, there is no indication to use a very high dosage of tranexamic acid. We even usually don't use a continuous infusion. We usually give one to two grams as a short infusion at the beginning of surgery. Um, we, we nearly never see seizures or just with, with this dose. 
Um, there's one important point uh, which may be interesting to mention is that uh, besides, uh, Catherine was talking about DDAVP, that also tranexamic acid has a positive effect on platelet functionality in patients on dual antiplatelet therapy. It doesn't normalize, but within 20 minutes, there's a significant improvement. And uh, the reason might be that, uh, of course, tranexamic acid protects the, the thrombin receptors from an uh, um, attack by thrombin as well as plasmin. Uh, so that might be um, a dose-dependent effect and uh, that in big procedures, therefore some people are using a higher dose, but uh, we, we don't do this. But um, yes, we use tranexamic acid also in particular in patients with dual antiplatelet therapy to, to have uh, some improvement of platelet functionality which is much quicker than after DDAVP, which takes one to one and a half hours for the maximum effect. Thank you. Um, the next question from that same person, regarding the flow chart for heparin and protamine used routinely in Randwick, how does this vary for duration of cardiopulmonary bypass pump run and extra heparin via perfusionist? Okay, so there's lots of different ways to calculate your dose, and the way that we've decided to do it is the European guideline way, which is looking at the total dose required to get the ACT over 450. And it's written on that thing, uh, it'll hopefully be available from Maggie if you're interested, but whatever dose got you over 450 before you went on to bypass is the dose that you're reversing. So if you've got a longer pump time and you're giving more heparin, you're also having more metabolism. So we made a decision to go with that routine and to analyze that routine and it seems to be working well. Of course, there's lots of different ways of doing it. Uh, the Americans do it based on body weight, which kind of works out the same in the long run really, um, because the dose of heparin's worked on body weight. But we just look at the dose to go on to bypass and we are reversing that and that's working pretty well. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's very important not, not to use the total dose given during cardiopulmonary bypass time because that results always in, a, in an overdose uh, because we, we can consider that usually 25% of the heparin dose is metabolized. And of course, we redose because it's metabolized. So that means that, of course, um, in, in long cases, we, we should not use a total dose of heparin given during bypass. It's just the the, the primary dose to achieve uh, our, our targeted ACT and then use something about 70% uh, from this that uh, works usually quite well. And from my point of view, it's, it's even easier to handle a slightly residual happen effect and then give whatever one milliliter, two milliliters protein in addition. But uh, if we have an overdose, we, we cannot take it out again. Uh, then, then it's in. Okay, and final question also um, pertaining to Randwick. Uh, maybe Dr. Gerlinger, if you have any um, feedback to this one as well. When you implemented the goal-directed approach at Randwick, how did the staff adapt to this change management and how do you keep accountability? Change management. It's a very interesting topic. Um, so this clearly is a journey and you have to identify um, when you're implementing a change initially, you have to identify uh, who's going to be interested and who's going to not be interested and manage these people differently. Um, as long as you remain authentic and empathic and you have rigorous logic with everything you're implementing, people will usually come on board eventually. So they're the three things, empathy, authenticity and rigorous logic. And then sometimes if you do find that there's someone that's just not getting it and not with the group, one thing that we did do uh, was um, one year we noticed there was um, someone that was really an outlier that hadn't come on board yet. And so we got through the ANSCATS database, which many of you will have, we got our data manager to pull up the data per anesthetist of, I can't remember if it was number or percentage of um, people having red cells, fibrinogen, uh, cryo, FFP, platelets, a uh, number of your patients that got taken back for bleeding. We, we chose a half a dozen endpoints. We, there was about 12 of us anesthetists. We each got allocated a random number. So I'm randomly number eight or something. 
and then everyone's de-identified, but there's a graph of who's had, of who's doing, giving this, this amount of red cells and we're all giving around X percent of our patients get red cells, X percent of our patients get cryo. There was a few outliers with the FFP, which then resulted in the people, in fact, for that example, the person that saw that they were giving more FFP than everybody else went, oh, I'm number such and such, is that me? Should I be doing this? So that was quite useful. But then people are able to compare themselves even just within a department of a dozen people with everybody else and have a talk about what are we doing and why. And so by doing that, I gave people de-identified feedback on their cohort of cases. And of course, so there was one person that year who'd only been in the hospital twice and done two dissections. Um, so of course, their data was always going to look different than those of us that are there every week doing routine cases. But it, you can use the ARANSCATS data if the anaesthetist is allocated in there. We each put 50 bucks in for the audit and used it for our college CPD and so put that in a Christmas card for the data manager. And he was happy as to pull up all this data and spend some time um, presenting it to us in that de-identified fashion so we could reflect. So introducing reflection with an example like that is how we can do that. Yeah, I also completely agree. I think uh, to bring everybody on board is, is very important. So it's not only interdisciplinary that we have um, anesthesiology, surgery, uh, intensivists. It's, I think it's also interprofessional. Um, I think education of nurses, at least in, in Germany, is, is very important because they are doing a lot of work, in particular at the ICU, and uh, they even asking for a specific uh, education. And uh, I think that that takes some time, uh, but in the end, it is uh, very effective. And also have this feedback, also in the randomized trial we did. Uh, the surgeons, for example, were blinded if a case was done with, um, with Rotem or without Rotem. Uh, but we were asking them if there was a revision surgery needed. Um, in, in, the, in the standard lab group, they said that it was um, about 80% coagulopathic bleeding. In the Rotem group, not knowing that there were patients from the Rotem group, they said it's 80% surgical bleeding. So when we showed them after the study, the results that changed practice that the surgeons didn't say anymore when the patient was bleeding at the ICU, we have to go back to theater. They were asking, do we have to go back to theater? Because if it was coagulopathic, we can manage this at the ICU. If it's surgical, we should go to the theater as soon as possible, because of course the, the situation will not get better again with plasma, platelet, or fibrinogen substitution, then again, they need as soon as possible uh, a, a surgical uh, therapy to close the hole. All right, thank you so much. That's all of the questions that we had. Um, thank you again for your fantastic presentations to both of you. I'm um, sorry that we've gone a bit over and thanks to everyone who's been able to stick with us a bit late tonight. Um, thanks to everybody who submitted questions. Um, thankfully, we were able to get through all of them. So that concludes tonight's Emerge event. Um, do either of you have any um, last closing remarks that you'd want to make before we close for tonight? Are you happy to leave it there? Definitely. Yeah, no, I think, yeah, it uh, was very nicely addressed from Catherine that, yeah, the, the, the kind of implementation, it, it takes a lot of enthusiasm. Uh, education, 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 and uh, a lot of collaboration and consents. Um, Just otherwise, not. it's not possible. Yeah. Yeah. And patience. Yeah. Patience. You're watching the intensivist giving the FFP mm -hmm. to your patient. Mm -hmm. And you're saying, that's okay. That's okay. Let me show you this evidence again. And I know that you'll get it next time. Mm -hmm. And I'll be here. I've got three children in private school. I'll be here for 10 more years. We'll get there. Yeah, and that was the reason I said education of nurses is so important because we had the case that one of the cardiac surgery seniors came to the ICU and asked the nurse to give two units of fresh frozen plasma. And the answer from the nurse was, what is the evidence for that? Good. <laughs> That's what I'm asking. Yeah. That's where we need to be. Right. <laughs> yeah. That's a good way to well, finish. Yeah. What was the evidence yes. for that? <laughs> Well, thank you again okay. so much. Um, thanks to everyone for taking time out of your busy evenings to join us. Couple last points. Um, next Wednesday is our virtual Rotem in Cardiac Simulation Workshop, 
which will cover Rotem interpretation using real cardiac case examples to allow you an opportunity to learn interpretation if you're a beginner or to sharpen your skills if you're an experienced Rotem user. And also our next eMERGE topic, um, Rotem and Trauma will be held next month. It will be our second trauma topic for the year. So be on the lookout for more details to come uh, for, for that webinar and workshop. Um, details will be coming by email. Um, and that's it. So thanks again so much. I'm Maggie Harrington. Thanks from our whole Warfin team. Thank you so much again to our speakers, Dr. Downs and Dr. Gorlinger. We're so grateful for your time and your expertise. Um, so have a good night, everyone. And we hope to see you next time or hopefully next week. Okay. Bye-bye. See you next week. Yeah. Yes. Fingers crossed. Bye. <laughs>